Okay, I think we're going to get started. Thanks so much for joining us. We're thrilled to see so many people attending this webinar today. My name is Karen. Thank you so much for attending this information session on our Italy Summer Abroad Program. Before we start, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So we have a pretty jam-packed agenda, and I'm hoping that we will end in an hour and 30 minutes. Basically, the main sections we're going to be covering during this agenda is I'm going to make some grand introductions to all the participants uh, that will be contributing to this session. Following that, I'm going to provide a very brief overview of Summer Abroad, the advantages of taking our program. Following that, we're very fortunate to hear from all of our professors who will be teaching courses courses this summer. So we have professors Anne Rabansik, Scott Wortley, Giancarla Perditi, Michael Letieri, and Stuart Kamenetsky. We are very gracious for them to be with us. They will be speaking individually about their course momentarily. Following that, I will be talking more about the program details, flight accommodations. Then we're going to hear from Zhou Zhao, who is former student participant of our anthropology course. He'll be saying a few words about his student experience in Italy. Following that, we are also very fortunate to have Vincenzo Di Pietro, who is our longtime on-site coordinator. He's here to talk more about his role and about accommodations and what to expect when you do get to Siena. Following that, I'll be discussing the costs, financial assistance, opportunities, how to apply, the timeline, and of course, question and answer. So as you may notice, this is a webinar, so we can't necessarily see you. However, you could contribute in terms of asking us questions. There's a Q&A feature at the bottom. We do advise you to use that feature anytime during this presentation. For instance, if you have a specific question to a professor after the professor speaks about their course, uh, please jot this down in the Q&A. This is the time for the professor to answer your questions. Please note, I'll be answering admissions questions or any other questions that you may have at the end. All of your questions will be answered either in the back end or live. This session will also be recorded. The link to this recording will be available on our website and also sent to all attendees. Finally, I want to let you know who is helping us in the back end. We have Wendy, who is our program advisor. She'll be helping out with the question and answers. We have Anastasia, who is our frontline advisor. She'll be also helping us with question and answers. And finally, we have Lorraine, who is our director, who will be helping us out at the back end as well. Thank you so much for helping us host this session. For those of you who are not as familiar with what Summer Abroad is, first of all, it's really exciting to let you know that we we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. We've been around for a long time. And in fact, our first program and courses offered in 1972 was in Siena. And since 1972, this location has remained as one of the most popular destinations. In fact, the first group of students who set off for Siena in 1972 took courses in fine art and Italian studies. Things haven't really changed <laughs> since 50 years ago, but we're very honored and thrilled that um, we are still offering these really exciting courses. Since then, Summer Abroad program has grown dramatically in the years. We've offered many destinations and courses, and it still has become one of the largest study abroad programs in Canada. So Summer Abroad is an opportunity for students to earn a full year arts and science credit, not transfer credits, in three to six weeks. For the Italy program, in this case, it will be up to five weeks. So you gain one full year U of T credit in five weeks. It is immersive. There's a lot of work in terms of field trips, but you do get a one-year credit, which is quite amazing. This is in the summer, so it doesn't interfere with your regular academic plans. For Italy's case, is at the end of summer. So during the beginning of your summer session, you still have time to take possibly another course, you know, work. So it really doesn't interfere with the majority of your plans, even in the summer. So we do offer these courses that are related to the destination. This year, we're offering destinations virtually as well as on-site from all around the world, over 10 of them for this year. Most of our courses for summer
some are brought is taught by U of T faculty. For Italy's case, it's all taught by U of T faculty. This is a great feature. Faculty members get to actually travel to Siena, stay at the same town, the same cities, travel with you during the field trips. So it's a really great uh, opportunity to really get your get to know your fellow classmates as well as your professor. Lots of students take our courses for different reasons. It could be to fulfill a program, breadth, or distribution requirements. And because of that, people that you meet in your classes aren't necessarily from the same programs. They're from different faculties, different campuses, from different years. So again, it's a great chance to get to know new people from U of T, but at a different locale. I might have mentioned these are small classes. Usually it ranges from 18 to maybe 28 students. It's not like your typical lecture hall classroom at U of T. You really get to know your professors. You really get to know your classmates. So the small class environment really gives students an opportunity to build close connections with other members of the university community. For many students, I have to say the personal interaction between faculty and students is what a lot of students really value about this study abroad experience. And I have to say as well on the other side, lots of professors have mentioned to me saying that teaching for this program has been one of their teaching highlights as well. So it goes both ways and that's, that's what makes experience very special. This is an all-inclusive study option. So what I mean by that is usually arrangements that you usually freak out about when you do travel alone, our office takes care of the field trip, the entrance ease, the local transportation, accommodations, orientations. This is all organized by our office, as well as our on-site staff, as well as our partner university. So we work very hard to make sure all of the necessary planning that you're usually used to, that we take care or at least give you a lot of advice about before you travel. You have access to on-site non-academic support, people like Vincenzo, as well as many other on-site staff that knows the language that is there to help you to know your surroundings as well as the city of Siena. They also are there, very importantly, for emergencies. So if you need any help, any assistance, any time, you could give them a call. They live in the same accommodations. They'll be able to help you out. And lastly, we don't just leave you alone in terms of planning. We make sure that we guide you through that process. We host pre-departure orientations. This year, it's going to be mandatory. So we do tell you lots of on-site information that you must know. We also work in conjunction with Safety Abroad Office at U of T to ensure that you are well informed of everything that you need to know before you travel. And just a couple more points about the benefit of taking on-site programs. Your location becomes a living textbook. You're not stuck in a classroom. You experience what you learn through your field trips. So through Italy, lots of classes go to Rome, they go to Florence, they go to Venice, they go to different cities. And it's really related to the course material that you learn. So you connect with guest speakers as well as local experts abroad. These field trips complement the course content and they are curated by your professor and local staff to offer a very valuable experience. You venture like the tours and the guest speakers and the venues. These are really thought out and they really do complement the course. This is one of the highlights I have to say about your learning experience once you do participate in a program such as this. This is less stress. As I mentioned, accommodations, mandatory field trips, and some program activities are arranged by our office. You become a global citizen, so you become immersed into the culture. You get to experience what it really feels like to be a student at the University of Siena. It's not necessarily the same as a student at U of T, and that's the point. We want to be immersed, and we want you to really experience living in a different culture, a different city, different country. This only just does benefit your whole experience. You also experience and live like local students, and you get to practice your Italian, so that's also an added feature. You boost your self-confidence and independence. Travel, taking part in this kind of program really does make you feel more confident without even knowing it. At the end of these pro this program, I do notice a shift, a difference with students, with their confidence and their openness to travel again. Lastly, but not least, you create lifelong friendships. Lots of students say that they love their lifelong friend come from this program. It may be only five weeks, but you're stuck together or maybe uh, they're your roommate and you really get to know them. Believe me, lots of these friendships and relationships do extend past the program and that's very special as well. Just a few points about this year's program. As I mentioned, it's our 50th anniversary. The program began in 1972. And since then, over 5,300 students have participated with this program. The date for the summer for the on-site program is from Saturday, July 30th to Friday, September 2, which is approximately five weeks. It is hosted by the University of Siena. We're so fortunate that we've been partners with the University of Siena for 50 years. The University of Siena is Italy's second oldest 
University dating back to 1240. It is, of course, uh, located in Siena, which is a very beautiful medieval Tuscan town. Classes are regularly from Monday to Thursday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Of course, this could be a bit different depending on the course. The co program falls at the same time as the Palio. I'm going to get Professor Letieri to talk more about the Palio. The Palio is every August 16th, and you get to join people watching this historic beer back horse race at the Piazza del Campo. This tradition actually started in 1597. So we're very fortunate that our program lies during the Palio and the week leading up to Palio. So the trial races and all that. It is a really exciting time to be there and students really call it a highlight as well when they stay in Siena. So we are offering a five courses this year with mandatory field trips. And of course, the purpose of this program, it's not just a, it's not a vacation. It is primarily an academic program. As I mentioned, you're gaining a full year credit. So we want to make sure that you know that this is a priority and that you're expected to be in class each time, as well as participate in the field trips each time as well. Your experience will be similar to that of a student from Italy. You're stating in accommodations in Toronto, it may be a bit different when you do stay in Siena. So please keep that in mind. Now, I'm going to ask Professor Michael Letieri, who is the Vice Dean of Academic Experience at UTM, Professor of Italian Studies and Instructor of Modern Italian Culture, really long-term friend of our program, say a few words about Siena. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Good afternoon, all. Buon pomeriggio. Buongiorno, as we say in Italian. Yes, uh, I have taught in Siena uh, numerous times. Now, uh, would I go every summer teach there? Yes, uh, I certainly would. What is it about uh, this program that uh, makes me and my other colleagues uh, really want to go back year after year? To study abroad is certainly an experience that all students should have. When learners uh, experience another place and another culture firsthand, it really puts things into perspective. It encourages them to have a personal encounter with the world. It makes them see how things are instead of imagining how they may be. What makes this program even more special is the destination itself, Siena. Eh? What a beautiful name. One of the most beautiful cities in the world. And 50 years ago, the University of Toronto chose Siena as the site of its uh, Italian study abroad program. They could have chosen many other cities in Italy, but they chose Siena. A choice uh, determined above all, I believe, from the love that we all have for this wonderful city and full aware, all of us, that being associated with such a city as many sustain is truly a privilege. Now, how does taking a study abroad course differ from a regular course, for instance, at the University of Toronto campus. How does this program enhance your overall learning experience? Well, searching the field of teaching and learning has constantly found the most successful students are those who take an active role in their own learning, both within and outside traditional classroom setting. We know that the most successful learning experience in involve active engagement in activities that offer more authentic and more hands-on contact uh, with the object of study. Study abroad offers exactly that and more. Now, the Siena program is celebrating, as Karen said, its 50th anniversary this year. As she was also saying, since 1972, over 5,000 students have studied in this wonderful city of Siena. And uh, the question that students who have been there ask, what makes this city so special? What makes this city an ideal location? Well, uh, let's see if I can uh, just describe it in just a few words. The first thing that comes to mind, it is a truly stunning medieval city, winding lanes, by lanes. The entire city is a UNESCO heritage site. The entire city, not just a building or a museum or a statue, but the entire city. The entire city.
really is a remarkable work of art. Now, the center of Siena is simply magical. As students and faculty who go there are stunned, are fascinated, they're humbled by the beauty of the city. They are stunned by its artistic monuments, by its artistic heritage, its magnificent contrade, and these are districts that date back to the Middle Ages, raised in the Palio, as you will see when you'll be there. And really what also amazes us every year is its stunning, truly stunning square. I'm sure my colleagues would agree that it is perhaps the most beautiful square in the entire world. What is the Palio? Very simply, it's not just a horse race. It is much more than a. What I can say is that you will really have to see it. You will really have to live it to believe it. And uh, this is really an opportunity for you to do just that. Now, Siena is a remarkable cultural experience. Uh, makes us reflect on uh, who we are, where we've been, and where we hope to be. Now, previous participants called the Siena Summer Abroad Program, they've called it life-changing, transformative, and many have called it uh, the highlight of my academic career. Now, a student who studied in this program stated, and I'm just going to quote, what did the student say? He said, studying in Italy, allowing me to jump right into Italian life, made me appreciate and understand Italian culture even more. Because for the first time, I wasn't just told about Italy from teachers or from a text. I was finally living it firsthand. Yes, the student is so right. Words, pictures, videos even are not enough. Only by going and studying in Siena, you will understand the city and you can get a real sense of what the city is all about. And when you return, you will also have your story to tell, your story about Siena, your story about Italy, and about your courses. Five outstanding courses, five wonderful courses. And this is a story that a resume, a curriculum can never tell. I look forward to seeing you all in Siena in person very soon. Thank you so much, Professor Letieri. That was perfect. Thank you so much. We are going to get started with all of our professors to speak about their courses. So I'm going to replicate the order of what we list our courses on our website. The course outlines are here as well. So if you want to follow along, this would probably be the best way of doing so when you hear from the professors as well. I'm going to ask Professor Anna Urb Urbansek to speak about her course in Italian regional food waste and culture. Thank so you so much. Welcome. It's cold outside, but in Siena in the summertime, it will be warm and you will feel the warmth of that welcome. And I would like to welcome you on behalf of all of my colleagues. And also, I'd like to thank them all for giving such support to uh, the program and making sure that it works so well. Nini and Karen and Wendy and Anastasia and Lorraine, and also my teaching colleagues. We're all in this together and we want to make this a fabulous, fabulous program for you. Sienna will change you and it will change change you because it will give you a different worldview. It will give you the opportunity, as Professor Lettieri has said, for friendships, independence, and for just thinking about what Italy really is as opposed to in a book. And my course is one of those courses that I also hope, I know, it will change you. It's about Italian food and food ways. I'm sure that you probably know a little about Italian food. You don't have to have, of course, a prerequisite. As long as you eat and appreciate appreciate a food, you can take this course. So perhaps you know about cappuccino, but did you know about the rules about when to drink it? Perhaps you know about spaghetti, lasagna, and macaroni, but maybe you didn't know that the different shapes of pasta require different sauces. You probably have heard of the fabulous award-winning wines in Italy, but maybe you knew nothing about Italy's growing beer industry. And pizza. Do we even know how many variations of pizza there are. I don't, but perhaps you didn't know that Italians eat pizza differently from North Americans. And what about tiramisu and gelato in order to finish the meal? But perhaps you didn't know how gelato is different from ice cream. You will know after taking my course. 
And you will also realize this, what this survey has discovered, that over 25,000 people surveyed, Italian food was the most popular food, not only in the US, but worldwide, averaging 84% in popularity. And the best thing is even Italians themselves, 99% of Italians had a favorable opinion of Italian food. They're so proud of their food and food ways. So why does everyone love Italian food so much? Well, I think there is a secret and you will find that secret when you come to our course. In our five weeks of exploring Italian foodways, you will discover the foods and wines from several regions of Italy. You'll have a chance to do some hands-on research to complement our classroom sessions. You'll be able to understand better and report on the fascinating history and the social cultural contexts of Italian food because we're going to be looking at ingredients and cookbooks, who ate what, where, when, why, including what the instruments and implements were that they used. We're going to talk about kitchens and cuisine and identity. We're going to talk about politics. Yes, anthropology, about food and religion, and also about very relevant issues such as food security and food food fraud, and the effects of COVID on the food systems in Italy. And we'll even stop for a little while to discuss a little pasta war that has started up fairly recently. We're going to taste and test many foods. We're going to make some of them and learn how they were and served on our various field trips to Florence, Perugia, and Bari. Bari is where Nini comes from, and he's going to be the stalwart coordinator there. You will get to a appreciate him, that's for sure. And we're going to go to small towns in Umbria and Tuscany to other regions. And as a special treat, we're going to take a trip to the city that was voted the cultural capital of Europe for 2019. And that's the city of Matera. Uh, Matera, you may have heard of because it's where the last James Bond film was filmed. And we were there just as they started filming in 2019. And the students of 20 2019, which is the last time we went to Siena, were absolutely taken by the magic of this city, Matera, which is in the arch of the boot of Italy, in this region of Basilicata. And the, the students themselves asked to have this field trip repeated and perhaps extended because they loved it so much. And so we're going to try to do that. And we're going to contrast what we discovered about food in Italy with Italian food outside of Italy. Students have told me that they really appreciate the fact that this is not a tourist Italian cooking course but a fascinating excursion into the heart of Italian foods and food culture and into the heart of Italians. Because for Italians, their food is a delicious and a wonderful source of pride. And they are very, very happy and hoping to share it with you. Students have also told me that this course, once they've come back, gave them the confidence to walk through Italian restaurants and food stores to purchase food food and ingredients that they learned about and tasted in Anthropology 396Y. And they now know the history of it, and they now know how relevant it is to Italian culture. So let me invite you to come with me as we visit a coffee roaster, award-winning baker, an organic pasta maker. We're going to have a cheese producer talk to us, a winery, and more. And you certainly will come away understanding the role of food as a basic element element of cultural exchange, and you'll be able to appreciate why Italians are so proud of their food. And to top it all off, you'll be in Siena, and Michael Lettieri has told you that Siena is a UNESCO heritage site, but you'll be learning about the Italian Mediterranean diet, which is a UNESCO intangible heritage. So I invite you to come with me, ask questions. You can email me, readily available online. You can see my email online and on the 
the first slide of this and here in the last slide. I also want to say that thanks to all the support that I get from Woodward College, we try our very, very best to accommodate dietary restrictions. We can't accommodate all, but we try our very best. So I look forward to sitting with you over a delicious meal as the Tuscan sun sets over the Siena countryside and we'll wish each other buon appetito. See you in Siena. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Urbancic. That was amazing. Thank you. I'm going to call on Professor Scott Wortley to speak about his course on current issues in international criminology. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this orientation session, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the course I'll be delivering this summer on international issues in criminology. I'm a little bit distracted and hungry now after uh, watching the previous presentation. I can guarantee you that despite the fact that you'll be taking a course in criminology, you will have plenty of opportunities to sample the food and drink of the region, and uh, we make it, in fact, a major part of this course. I also really you know, like the, the mention of uh, James Bond. Uh, the region has been uh, in many recent James Bond movie. In fact, if you want to watch Quantum of Solace, a couple of James Bonds um, that go with Daniel Craig, the beginning of the movie is at the Palio and involves uh, great scenery and great shots of Siena. Uh, there's also a lot of gunfire and a lot of violence, but I can assure you that I've never seen a gun or any gunfire while we've been visiting Siena. It's a very lovely and peaceful location. What I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today with respect to my course is just um, outline, first of all, what the course entails. Second of all, outline some of the major field trips that we, we will be going and, and just uh, going on and just talking about the, the impact uh, as a life experience. It is, uh, it's an honor to teach uh, a criminology course within Italy. The region has given birth to modern criminology. Many of the original theorists associated with the birth of criminology, including Lombroso and Beccaria, are, are of Ital Italian heritage. We also know that the birth of modern criminal justice systems can be linked back to, to ancient Rome. But we're going to be focusing primarily on contemporary issues, um, although there will be some history involved. We're going to focus, to begin with, on international patterns and trends with respect to criminal activity and some of the theoretical meanderings that try to explain or document why these regional differences exist. We're going to move on to a section on the birth of the mafia uh, within Italian, uh, within Italy, and the spread of uh, international organized crime. We're going to focus on issues of immigration, crime, um, and social control. The migration crisis that has been experienced by most of Europe has also had at its center Italy and migration across the Mediterranean. We're also going to focus on issues of hate crime in the international context, um, issues of street gangs, issues related to international trafficking, human trafficking, and the trafficking of drugs and other contraband. We're going to look at international trends and patterns with respect to corporate and white collar crime. We're going to look at uh, radicalization and the growing phenomenon. I was just watching the trucker protest of homegrown terrorism and radicalization. We're also going to look at contemporary international trends and the development of crime prevention and law enforcement strategies. And important here, we're going to be focusing on issues of artificial intelligence and how this technology is being used in the international context to try to reduce crime, violence, and terrorist activity. We're going to uh, engage in a number of really special field trips that I think really enhance uh, the experience. First of all, we are going to be taking a day-long field trip to one of the great wineries in the Tuscany region. Um, you may ask, what are we going to talk about? What does this have to do with crime and criminal justice? And I had to be very creative here. You know, during the bus trip and during the days leading up, we're going to talk about the role that prohibition played with respect to the development of, of uh, the mafia in North America, the, a key role that alcohol played with respect to the growth of international criminal networks and how that continues today with respect to the international trade and substances. We're also going to talk about the relationship between alcohol and violent crime and other criminal behaviors as part of the context. That was the best justification I could use for spending a lovely afternoon sampling the food and wine of the Italian region. Um, we're also going to take a weekend trip to Rome, where we're going to be visiting various sites, including the Colosseum, including um, the Italian uh, Museum of Criminology, including the Vatican. We also take, in both Florence and Rome, night tours, um, which discuss the role that violence and crime have played in the development of city-states, and uh, also looking at some famous contemporary Italian criminal events and, and their aftermath. We also take a day trip to Florence, uh, which is only about an hour from Siena. For those of you who, uh, many of the students already visit Florence as part of uh, their days off or the weekends. And there we're also going to be visiting uh, some of the great art galleries of Italy, including the Uffizi. Talk about the role that justice and justice images have played in modern art. One of the highlights of the uh, the program 
program and kind of a life-changing event that many students come back years later and just say that it was an absolutely fabulous experience is we will be visiting the hill town of Volterra. And Volterra uh, is the home uh, right within the city walls of a maximum security, security prison. And this is a very special maximum security prison because the inmates, as part of their rehabilitation, uh, learn the art of cooking, uh, of hosting um, in the tourist industry. And several times a year, they host an evening for outsiders, uh, outside uh, tourists and locals who come in and uh, basically spend an evening inside a maximum security prison being wined and dined by the inmates. We will have a multiple course dinner with uh, many wine pairings. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to interact and discuss a life within the prison with the inmates themselves. It often, at the end of the evening, breaks out into song and dance. Uh, and you'll experience this all uh, within the courtyard of a maximum security prison. Um, it has been one of the greatest experiences that I've ever had as a criminologist and I've visited uh, prisons around the world. But this is very unique, special, and, and if I could use the word magical. The course itself is seminar style. We'll be meeting four times a week in the morning from 9 to 12. The instruction will involve lectures, uh, but also a great deal of attention and focus will be put on classroom discussions and debate, as well as having a few virtual guest lectures on specific topics that I will arrange um, for, the, for our time there. Um, it is life-changing. It has been one of the greatest experiences uh, of my life. It's already been mentioned that one of the uh, great privileges of this program is that, you know, unlike your courses at uh, U of T during the regular term, um, you meet on a, a very frequent basis, you know, four times a week in a small class setting. The classes are, are typically no larger than 20, 30 students. So you really get a chance not only to know your fellow student, but you get a great chance to interact with your instructors. So I know to this day, all the uh, students that have taken my Siena class in the past, we stay in contact. Incidentally, three of uh, the students that I have had in the Siena program are now in the PhD program. I'm supervising them as part of their doctoral education. So um, they've got turned on to criminology and uh, decided to pursue uh, PhD studies because of Siena. There's also many opportunities to interact in day-to-day -day life out in Siena. It's a, it's a fair-sized town, but it's also small enough that you will meet each other on the street, have a meal, engage in, in conversation. I have to warn you that I have uh, two young children who absolutely adore Siena and are, have, have missed it very much. Sometimes I will pass my children off uh, to you for babysitting every once in a while during this uh, this period of time, uh, but they're great kids and, and uh, uh, you'll enjoy their company. We will also visit uh, certain sites within Siena. We will get to go to various police stations within and including police headquarters within Siena where we will learn about policing in the Tuscan region. We will learn about the forensics labs that exist there and how issues of immigration are dealt with in this location. You'll get a chance to interact with the top police officials. And then that as part of that day, for instance, we also have lunch in a hidden valley that is one of the most beautiful spots of Siena, where there is a great restaurant with fantastic food, but it's part of a reintegration program for inmates who have been uh, released from uh, a local correctional center. So once again, continuing with the criminological theme, it's a magical place. I don't know if I have queued up a, uh, a brief uh, news item on the Volterra prison tours. Operations were un armed guards kept watch above as the aperitivo was laid out in the courtyard. And as Rosario Campagna served Prosecco, he was also serving a 26 year sentence for murder. How is it to have all of these folks here tonight? Freedom? Yep, the Fortezza Medicea is a prison in Volterra, Italy. It's home to some of the country's most hardened criminals. And on eight nights a year, it's host to a dinner where the prisoners do all the work. It's designed to raise money for charity, build skills, and give inmates the chance to interact with those on the outside. In the kitchen, these criminals who admit they've made bad choices in the past are more focused on the future or at least the next few hours. The pasta was thrown into the pot at about 20 minutes to 10. This is Italy after all. And then it was mixed with a delicate parsley sauce. My friend Francesco Innocenti is in for aggravated murder. This is where we are, so this is where we must grow, he said. It's like a plant. It grows where it's planted. The food got good reviews, but the real draw was the novelty. 
how is it to be having dinner inside a prison? It's very strange because uh, we don't know if uh, we come and uh, if we come back. Joking aside, by the end of dinner, curiosity had given way to a connection. And for a moment inside this prison, the walls seemed to disappear. Seth Jones, CBS News, Volterra, Italy. Thanks, everybody, for that opportunity. That'll give you a taste. That's one of the experiences that you will have if you come to Siena and take this course. Thank you so much, Professor Wortley. Since most criminology courses require the fundamentals, such as CRI 251, will this criminology course really require no prerequisite? Basically, we just follow whatever is listed on the arts and science calendar. According to the calendar, this course, as well as the course code, does not have prerequisites. So that's what we follow. Many of the students who take the course, in fact, aren't majoring in criminology. We've had students come over from uh, from history, from political science, from various disciplines. The course is open to, to all. And it actually, I think, contributes to the discussions that we have in class when we bring in individuals from other disciplines who contribute new perspectives to uh, these topics. Absolutely. And I could say the same for Professor Abansik's course as well. Professor, you could probably speak about having a wide range of students from different programs. I really love the fact that there is a wide range of students because they can make connections with with their own food ways, things that they're familiar with and unfamiliar with. And we've made some really delightful uh, coincidences. We've met them and we've compared foods from different areas that are similar, but not quite the same and perhaps used for different reasons and served in different ways. So I'm always learning from my students. Also, is the criminology course suitable for individuals who don't know Italian, especially in the field trip, which they will be speaking Italian? The course is not delivered in Italian. It's delivered in English. All the tours and tour guides that we have provide uh, all the information in English. Um, you will learn gradually some Italian, I'm sure, as you're uh, spending time in Siena and navigating Italy, but everything uh, involved in the instruction and uh, assignments and tests is all delivered in English. May I add that that's the same thing for the anthropology course. I also speak Italian and when we have, there are a couple of uh, tour providers who don't speak, I translate for them. So we certainly don't miss anything. And most of the yeah. Italian I know, Nini taught me. So. I've learned from all of you, my, my <laughs> Italian language as well. Thank you so much. So we're going to continue on. So we are going to hear from Professor Giancarlo Periti, who will be teaching a fine art history course on studies abroad in Renaissance and Baroque art and architecture. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, first of all and uh, welcome to each and every one. I will be teaching, as Karen uh, anticipated, an art history course. And here we are. So we have already heard about Siena, which is we will all stay. We will learn together more about the cityscape, about all the monuments. And I'm just offering you some highlights of a great uh, political site in Siena, Palazzo Publico, or the public palace, the center of the government of medieval Siena. As you can see here, there is Simone Martini's Maesta, so a religious work of art. But then on the other side, there is also two political frescoes that you see here on the walls of the, of the government of Siena. And they talk about the effects of the good government, also of the bad government. So we will, of course, enter uh, Palazzo Publico and we'll have classes unpacking the meaning of these amazing works of art. In Siena, a lot of the classes will be on site, not only in the Palazzo Publico, but also in the Cathedral of Siena, the Baptistry, and there are wonderful panels designed by Donatellos, and then also the Piccolomini uh, Library with graduals and other liturgical books. And then we will visit also church
churches in Siena. As it has been said by my colleagues, it is really historical monument itself, the entire city. And we have this opportunity to have an art history course thought on site to create this kind of intimate relationship with the works of art, to admire the aesthetics of the work, but also to talk about the techniques that is really apparent in looking at the frescoes uh, here. In Siena also, we will enter the Ospedale of Santa Maria della Scala, which has been recently transformed into a museum, a field trip. So connect of course, with the course, there are several field trips, and one is in Pienza. You may have not heard of Pienza, but it's a little town within the province of Siena, and it was redesigned and remodeled on the input of a, a Pope, Pius II, as an ideal city. And so here you are looking at the cathedral, which is the facade, which seems almost, if you think about the classical art, you can see the pediment, you can see this arch. So it's really this kind of ideal monumental renaissance that we will be talking about. And then on the one side, on the one side, there is the Piccolomini Palace. And on the other side, there is also the Bishop's Palace. And so we will have a sense of how a renaissance city shape around a cathedral, shape around the bishop's palace was constructed. And then, of course, the idea of perspective on the on the square before this church. Another amazing field trip would be in Florence. We will enter to several museums, including the Bergello. Why the Bergello? Of course, also the Uffizi, but the Uffizi Museum is quite obvious. It's one of the best and renowned museums in the entire universe for Western art. The Bargello is less known, but the Bargello is equally relevant as an outstanding museum of sculpture. So it would be a full immersion into the art of sculpture, looking at masterpieces by Donatello, of course, the David that a lot of the art history students already know from previous courses courses, but then looking also at Michelangelo's work here, looking at the Bacchus and having the opportunity to move around, to tour around, to see all the different views that Michelangelo, the artist, has thought when thinking about this marble sculpture. And then also looking at Michelangelo's Brutus, and so a bust of an historical Roman protagonist, and how Michelangelo designed that. And we can, of course, begin to admire the non finito, the unfinished style that was part of Michelangelo's own poetic. And Florence, of course, will include also, or San Michele, will include the Academia, churches of Santa Maria Novella. We will stay in Florence overnight. And so it will be really an opportunity for you to immerse into the city and its great heritage, cultural and art historical heritage. And of course, the Uffizi, one of the <laughs> great masterpieces, a kind of manifesto of Renaissance Italy is Botticelli's Primavera or Springtime that you can see here. And we will be looking together at this work and we will be all together before this painting to admire the finesse in the rendering of the veil of the graces and the beautiful also costume of Flora with all these flowers. We will travel also to Rome. We will visit the Vatican together. We will visit also Baroque churches with masterpieces by Borromini and Bernini. Oh, but also we will be looking at the Farnesina. We will be entering into the Villa Farnesina, which is uh, which was originally a private villa owned by Agostino Chigi and which is now a museum. And he ordered this majestic loggia by, and it was executed by 
Raphael and his workshop. And in the Vatican, we will be looking at the Sistine Chapel, uh, Michelangelo's Last Judgment, also at Raphael's painted rooms. And I'm here showing you fresco from the third room, which is less known, is not always covered in the general art history courses. That's why I wanted to highlight this fresco, because we will be covering not, of course, what you have already learned in previous art history courses in Toronto, but we will build up on those knowledge that you have already acquired to expand, develop that knowledge with this on-site immersion before the works of art. The Vatican Basilica, and I wanted to highlight the facade, of course, here, Michelangelo's dome, but then also the obelisk at the center, so, and then Bernini's colonnade. What does it mean, as my colleagues have also pressed, to be there, to be on-site, and to have this uh, opportunity to look and discuss together works of art. And there will be also oral presentations that you will offer uh, based on the readings on specific topics. And here is a fountain. Rome is the city of fountains, especially executed in the Baroque period. So you will learn more about the these fountains as monuments, but also the role of fountains for poor people, the importance of water for the citizens of Rome. And we will travel to Venice, which is one of our field trips in Italy. Also, we will be staying in Rome for two nights, and so it, it will be really an extensive immersion for us in Rome and also equally in Venice. Venice, we will be visiting together the museums, the islands also of San Giorgio Maggiore, and then and also churches and have the opportunity to see, for example, this San Zaccaria altarpiece, which is still in situ. So on top of the altar, you can see, in fact, the candles here on top of the altar in this church in Venice. What is this kind of experience? As, as you will see, it's a monumental altarpiece, more than two meters high. So it's not something that from a slide, you can almost take all at once. But before this altarpiece, the viewer needs really to pause and to admire all the different techniques, this kind of fake mosaics, for example, in the apse, and then the fictive uh, marble here of the chapel, the connection with the outside, the landscape, and so inside and uh, outside. So it's an experience in formally reading works of art, but also formally experiencing what historical uh, viewers may have thought about the a devotional uh, painting itself. In Venice, we will be going also to other sites and churches. And here I wanted to highlight an amazing funerary uh, monument. A funerary uh, monument, it's tomb of the Doge Vendramin and so the head of the government in Venice. And this is a, a great masterpiece by Tullio and Antonio Lombardo, sculptured and architect. And one can tell multiple registers, but also there are pagan figures connected with the Christian metaphors and the Christian emblems in this monument. Thank you so much. I'm just going to check if there's any questions here for you. Are we allowed to take FAH 393 without the prerequisite to compensate? Could students read art history, 14th to 17th century art ahead of time and other works? You can certainly email me, and if you have taken other art history courses, you can certainly take this course, 393. I want to stress also that the prerequisite is not punitive, and I don't want to exclude people at all. I just want to ensure that students can do well, that they already have a knowledge about certain art historical techniques, like fresco or like tempera, 
panel that they know already when they look at the work certain preliminary information. If students email me, I have given already permission to take this course. Students who have taken other art history courses and not necessarily the 230, which is a foundational Renaissance art history course in our department. Okay, thank you so much. I, Professor Michael Letieri is going to come back up and speak about his modern Italian culture course. This course also will be delivered uh, in English, but uh, I promise you with uh, an Italian accent. Italy has often been referred as a nation of saints, as a nation of poets, a nation of navigators. Saints, of course, uh, St. Francis, uh, and we will be visiting um, Assisi. Another saint, uh, St. Catherine of Siena, and you will be visiting also her house in Siena. Poets, of course, Dante, Petrarca, and so on. Many more and navigators, uh, Columbus, uh, Amerigo Vespucci, Giovanni Caboto, and others. But uh, the more one reads about uh, contributions uh, of Italians to world history and culture, the more one realizes that Italians uh, are much more than that. What will we learn from this course? What will we learn from our classes, from our readings, from our trips to Assisi? We will go to Assisi, we will go to Perugia, we will go to Verona, we will overnight in Venice, we will go to Rome and overnight in Rome. We will also visit some small Tuscan towns like San Gimignano, Monte Rigioni, and others. What will we learn from our visit to Tuscan farmhouses? Yes, we'll be also visiting some farmhouses. We will also have a dinner in one of those farmhouses. And what will we learn from our passeggiate, from our walks and excursions in the city of Siena and in the other Italian cities that we will visit? Because in Italy, you will be doing a lot of walking. This is another promise. What will we learn from our stay in Tuscany and in Italy? Well, this is a course that will take you on a journey from the days of ancient Rome, and we are going to Rome, a journey from the days of ancient Rome to the present. Through this journey, you will in fact learn that Italians, Italians have indeed been instrumental in the development of modern Western civilization in multiple fields. For example, law, government, architecture, all forms of art, science, technology, fashion, cuisine, and much more. We will address all of these issues from ancient Rome to the Middle Ages, to the Renaissance period, to the fascist era, up to post-war Italy and to the present. Yes, we will study the culture of Italy, culture with the capital C, but we will also study the culture of Italy with the small C. We will try to answer together all kinds of different questions that uh, people who visit or who study in Italy may ask. For example, if you're in Siena and if you order a latte in a cafe, what will they serve you? Hey, this is, uh, they will probably serve you steamed coffee or steamed milk. Now, do Italians generally, as Professor Urbanci said and alluded to, do Italians generally order cappuccino after breakfast? Uh, do Italians, for instance, bargain down the price? at an open door, at an open air market, at a boutique, or even in an exclusive shop. Is wine sold in supermarkets? Do Italians tip at a restaurant? Uh, is standing at the bar cheaper than sitting down? Are people expected to cover bare shoulders and knees when entering a church? And what do Italians say when they walk into a store? Uh, they will say buongiorno, they will say buonasera. Uh, what do they say when they want to order? Or a coffee. Very simple, they will say, un caffè per favore. And what do these words mean? Uh, grazie, prego, scusi, arrivederci. Yes, we will also learn some Italian too. You will learn some key words and phrases that will be useful to you as you interact with the Italians in Siena and in Italy. But this will be just a small part of what we do. Now, the cultural insights are offered in this course will give you a better understanding and deeper appreciation of Italian life and culture. This course will take you through a journey of historical and uh, cultural discovery of a nation which geographically may not be very imposing. In fact, Ontario is three times the size of Italy, but which historically and culturally
boastfully, is uh, Italy, without any doubt at all, a giant. This course, uh, with its readings, its trips, uh, its passeggiate, as I said, through Siena and other Italian cities, this course will take you through a journey of uh, historical and cultural discovery that I'm certain you will never forget. I look forward to seeing you in my course or in any of the other wonderful courses being offered this summer. I wish I could take them all. If you have any questions, uh, you can e email me at uh, any time. And again, grazie and arrivederci. Thank you so much, Professor Lettieri. And last, but certainly not least, we have Professor Stewart coming up, talking about his course in special topics in psychology abroad, disability, culture, and inclusion. Thank you very much, Karen, and thank you to all of my colleagues. I could say a lot about Siena, but a lot has been said already. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world, and um, I look forward to going back there again. My name is Stuart Kamenetsky. I'm a full professor in the teaching stream in the psychology department at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. I spent most of my career as the director of the undergraduate program, so really most of my career has been geared towards um, undergraduate education. I think that perhaps one of the highlights of this has been um, developing this course, which is actually the first psychology course ever to be taught in what's Earth College uh, Summer Abroad Program. And it's been around for 50 years. So I'm very, very honored to have had the opportunity to be the first to offer a psychology course. Um, I offered it, this will be my sixth time. I've offered it three times in Oxford, once in Siena, and once online last year. As you see, many of us who teach in the Summer Abroad Program teach it over and over again, because we really, really love the experience, the very, very close contact with the students and so on. As Karen said before, this is first and foremost an academic um, experience. Many psychology students uh, want to go to graduate school in psychology, in social work, in education, and having an enriching experience is very, very important. When I look at my experience in Italy last time, I published a paper based upon that. I've had two undergraduate thesis students who are co-authoring papers with me, and I had a, a popular press article published with another student that I met in that experience. So this is a strong academic course, just like psychology science courses are in general um, at UTM. And if you're a little bit surprised, why are we offering a psychology course in Italy? So number one, consider reading the paper that I published on the subject. You can email me or you can get it through the Summer Abroad Program. But beyond that, as you have heard, Tuscany, northern regions in Italy have really been this, the center of the Renaissance in Europe. And the developments um, in all areas, including medicine, including mental health, including treatment of people with disabilities, um, have really been unparalleled um, at that particular period in time. Um, and a lot that has we have learned through these developments um, in parts of northern Italy have moved on to other areas. So it's, it's a wonderful, very, very interesting place to go to learn about disability. So this whole course will be dealing with the, with the central question, and it's not an easy one. And that question is, is disability the disability experience and it's inevitable consequence of impairment. We'll be comparing and contrasting two models. The medical model, which says, yes, you have a broken arm and now you can't write. Well, that's the reason why. Um, and the social model that really looks at periods in time, history, culture, nationality, the way society around us behaves, societal change, and really looks at these as the cause for disability experience. So that, for example, if a classroom is held on the second floor and you use a wheelchair, whether or not you could take the class can depend upon whether or not there's an ele elevator to get you to the class. And that would be a, a good example of the social model. Now, of course, participating in a summer abroad program, going to another country, learning about history and culture is really a great way to learn um, about um, the disability experience and compare uh, the medical and social models of disability. So we will have classes, of course, we'll have lecture and we'll have very interesting field trips to various different places to learn further about these issues. So in Siena, we're going to have an accessibility tour. Siena, of course, like other cities in Tuscany, is a hilltop city. It has many state
stairs. It is very steep in many different places. Um, it's not an easy place for people with mobility impairments to get around. So we're going to learn about what is done in the city of Siena and, and also what are the challenges that we need to meet. You know, it's not that easy to take a medieval town and make it fully wheelchair accessible. And we'll be learning about the balanced approaches that we need to think of um, when we want to preserve the beautiful, you know, history, beautiful architecture of a medieval city, uh, city such as Siena, while at the same time living up to modern and current requirements for accessibility and, and inclusion. We will also be visiting an old institution for mental health. Now, it's very, very interesting that most institutions for mental health um, have been destroyed. They've been bulldozed over. Um, if they were nice enough buildings, they were turned to into condos. This kind of a lot of whitewashing of the really terrible and destructive history that has taken place in terms of treatment to people with mental illness. And one of the wonderful things that, that you'll be able to see in Siena and in Italy all together is that we don't see, there's a lot of honesty. There's a lot of intellectual honesty in terms of thinking openly over the way things used to be, not just in Italy, but all over the world and still making these available for people to see. Um, so we'll get to see um, an old, what remains of an old institution for people with mental illness, which is really very, very close to where our classroom is going to be. Another place that we're going to visit in Siena is one of the big problems that we face is very high unemployment among adults with disabilities, especially adults with intellectual disabilities. And we're going to visit a wonderful, wonderful restaurant um, and eat there. Food has to be part of everything that we do, of course, in, in Italy, and they serve fantastic Italian food over there. And we're going to visit uh, this wonderful place that hires um, adults who have intellectual disabilities and developmental delays. And we're going to have a talk over there about the philosophy of hiring and how in good sort of Italian tradition and the commitment to the family, they use, they build relationships with individuals with whom they work and support in order to provide employment opportunities for adults with disabilities. In Florence, we're going to visit a couple of places. One of them is an old institution for children, for abandoned children. This is, of course, a World Heritage Site. Um, it's a uni UNICEF a research center for studying children. So really much has been learned from this particular how to raise children who have been abandoned. Of course, many children who have been abandoned are children that were born with congenital disabilities uh, that the family did not know how to or did not care to look after. Of course, we heard about this already uh, before, but one of the important connections that we'll learn about over here is the role that the Catholic Church played. We're going to see very, very interesting frescoes um, in that particular location, pictures of children and how children have been depicted and relating um, abandoned children with pictures, with paintings, I should say, of, of baby Jesus, and really learning at how, you know, at the very, very beginning of this whole notion of institutionalization for children. Very, very interesting, fascinating place. So another thing that we're going to do that also relates, of course, to art and Italian culture. Of course, as we know, Florence is an is a enormous center of Western art. The Uffizi Gallery is there and so on. One thing that was developed over there too was using these outstanding artisan skills that have been developed over there uh, to create medical images. So has, as advancements in knowledge of anatomy and physiology were taking place, in order to teach about it, you know, the, the local community put together um, images and models of various uh, different uh, individuals individuals, internal organs, and so on. And we're going to visit a very, very interesting museum of pathological anatomy in, in Florence in order to see some of these. We're going to continue learning about medicine and the impact of um, development of knowledge in medicine, in pathology, in anatomy, by visiting Padova or Padua. You know, when we visit the University of Padua over there, um, we're going to visit a, a large gallery where cadavers were studied publicly, you know, in a large, large room in a theater, what used to be called anatomical theater, where cadavers were dissected in front of, you know, a whole big, large class in order to see what's happening. So we'll be visiting the Museum of the, of the History of Medicine. Again, that's one city, one place where there have been huge advancements in the development of medicine. And we are going to go to Venice and visit another, what at the time used to be called an insane asylum. Of course, that, that was another institution for people with mental illness. It's low 
located in a beautiful, beautiful island, on a beautiful island in the Venetian uh, Lagoon. And that is, of course, an, an older institution that now has turned into a museum um, for mental health as part of our uh, very large and important focus on institutionalization. And one thing that's going to be um, there, especially, they don't sugarcoat anything. We're going to learn about all of the harsh treatments and experimentations that they have done over there with inpatients. I think that what's especially interesting to learn about is learn about the treatment of people with mental health problems over there compared to the way that they have been treated a lot further uh, south in, in Siena. If you look at the map, you'll see that Venice is not that far from Austria, for example. And um, in Austria and Vienna, of course, the medical approach was very, very strong and very much influenced what took place in Venice. And when you go further south, still northern Italy, but when you go further south to see Siena, you see more of the southern Italian influence, which is focused more on family and more and less medical and more and more on, you know, let's get through the day in a productive way and keep everybody happy rather than this stronger, harsher medical approach that you got from the north. So I look forward to uh, going there again. For those of you who will be interested in coming along, you're very welcome to reach out to me with any questions that you have about this course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kamenetsky. Thank you so much, all the professors, for the lovely presentations. This really is very exciting. So in terms of program activities, once you get to Siena, there are tons of activities that our on-site staff host, including walking tours of Siena, residence orientation, welcome get-together, a contrada dinner, um, an on-site academic orientation, which is mandatory. We also have a welcome re reception hosted by the University of Siena. There's an optional survival Italian tutorial. So if you want to know some common expressions in Italian, we will offer those courses as well. There are also non-U of T activities, and these are optional, and they're different each year. So these are not promised, but in the past, we've offered day of opera in Verona, uh, cooking classes, wine tasting, as well as horseback riding. Program, as it's 50 years old, we have lots of different activities that we do offer. Now, in terms of accommodations, as I mentioned, it's hosted by the University of Siena, and we use the residences there. So you take your classes in University of Siena, as well as your residences. Most recently, we've used Berndia, as well as Event Quattro Baggio. Hopefully I said that right, but it could change. It's more or less around the same area in Siena, so it's enclosed within the walls of Siena as well. You'll get more information about which residences that will be offered. Uh, they're mainly double accommodation. There are very few single available, so you could plan on a double room. You could indicate if you want a single room. It's not guaranteed, and we do prioritize based on medical conditions and other kinds of exceptions as well. Just letting you know that most students will be in double accommodations. There are washrooms uh, shared by two rooms, shared common kitchenette areas. Be prepared as this is an older university and infrastructure, Wi-Fi could be sometimes unreliable. There's no air conditioning. However, I've been to Siena as well. During the nighttime, it's a bit cooler. There's a nice breeze and there are no screens on the windows. Uh, there's a 3 a.m. curfew and a 24-hour porter as well. There's no meal plan. So you have to budget for meals and we indicate this on our cost chart. You know, you could go get a cafe or whatever, or you could prepare your own meals. Just keep that in mind that you have to budget for your meals while you're there. These are just a few pictures of the residences. This is the front entrance of the Sprendia residence, the courtyard, another courtyard, as well as the residence rooms. Now these are single rooms, but it just gives you an idea of the types of rooms that we do offer in the residence at the University of Siena. I took these pictures a couple of years ago, but this is just a typical walk that you have from the residence to the university. So it is really quaint, really nice. And then once you start living there, you really know the, the ways and the shortcuts of getting to campus. So it is quite different than what you're used to um, and is such a lovely experience. We're not going to be around the bush, bush and talk, and we have to talk about COVID. If you are thinking about applying to this program or have already started an application, here are some highly advisable things to do before you submit your application. You want to be ready and up to date for traveling during these times. We really suggest even before applying to review the COVID-19 planning page, which is provided by the Safety Abroad Office. You could go through the travel checklist and they provide really great things for you to consider and important things to do before you travel. Uh, you must be fully vaccinated by completing a COVID-19 vaccine series as indicated by the Global Affairs Canada Travel Advisory. This is a U of T course, just like taking any other U of T course, even here on campus, you must be vaccinated. 
designated. And for on-site programs such as this one, you are also expected to comply with the local requirements for vaccination at the destination location. So, you know, researching on what's needed in Italy, even before applying, would really help. Of course, our office will help in this process as well. But just being in the know of the changing news, according to Canada, as well as places uh, such as Italy, would really just benefit you in terms of being ready and being in the know of what's required in terms of traveling to that destination. Lastly, we have a really detailed FAQ page on our Summer Abroad website with lots of information that even provides things to think about when planning for a trip. So just Safety Abroad, when you look at their website, uh, this is what you see. They do have a really nice travel checklist. So we do ask you even before applying to take a look at what you must consider prior to traveling. As well as our website, we have a COVID-19 update and planning page. This will be updated as news does arrive. So we just do advise students to continue to check this page. As well, our office will work in conjunction with students to make sure that you are informed of any uh, updates as well. In terms of eligibility of participating in a summer abroad program, you must be in good academic standing, meaning that the CGPA must be at least 1.75 at the time of application. This is just to be eligible to apply for our courses. First year students with no final grades can apply. As we mentioned, a lot of our courses do not require prerequisites, so therefore first year students can apply to our courses. U of T students in a professional faculty or graduate program, U of T alumni and non-degree students are welcome to apply. However, current undergraduate U of T students will take priority and students from other North American universities require a letter of permission. If you have any friends that are interested in taking this course with you, uh, they're more than welcome to apply. They just have to apply for a letter of permission to get that credit transferred to their home university. So I did talk about COVID and there's just a couple more points that we do want to stress. As we navigate through this COVID world, we want to make sure that you review the most up-to-date requirements. Our office will work in partnership with Safety Abroad and we'll be monitoring and reviewing the updates as well, including various requirements such as screening, testing, proof of vaccination, and quarantine requirements if applicable. This year, our pre-departure orientation is mandatory, so we expect all students to attend, and we do brief students with all the current information and details that you may need prior to getting to your destination. Unfortunately, for this year, we are offering no group flights for any of our programs. Students must make their own travel arrangements to Rome. However, we're going to give students recommended flight to take, and we may offer bus transfers from Rome to Siena and back, depending on when most students plan to take their trips. So again, there's no group flight. However, we will guide you in terms of recommended flight itineraries when the time comes. So I want to invite Joe Joao took the ANT course in 2018, I believe. Um, if he could just say a few words about his experience in Italy. Thank you, Karen. And I really love the pictures you just showed. Uh, they're full of memories. And just looking at the weather here today in Toronto, I think it's the perfect time to start planning our summer in Italy. So uh, hi, everyone. My name is Joe. I'm a fourth year student majoring in psychology. Uh, before coming to U of T, I had worked at the Sushi Chef, first in Tokyo, Japan, then in Montreal, Canada. And I have a natural interest in different foods and culture. So when I took the ANT 396 in summer 2018, and just like Professor Anne said, it was a course that changed my life so much. Uh, while taking the classes in Italy, it was an in incredible experience when what you have learned becomes a part of you and you can reflect on it every time you eat. Some interesting fact I still remember include when and why people began to use a fork as a common utensil and why tablecloths in restaurants are white. Well, Professor Anne will provide you all the answers to these interesting questions. Uh, I especially love those field trips. For example, I got the chance to meet Dario Cecchini, who was an Italian butcher from Pizzano. I also enjoyed the workshops at the Espresso Academy in Florence and numerous tours to local wineries or food producers. I stress wineries. Oh, I also got to make pasta myself. Uh, that was just so different from the ones you got at the supermarket. Another big highlight was the travel around during the weekends. Because there were no classes on Fridays, that means every weekend is a long weekend that you can plan ahead and the visit at places in Italy or other European countries. For example, I used the weekend of patio and traveled to Netherlands with my classmates. So on this note, one benefit of having a small class is that you get to know more about your classmates and often you would become very close friends and travel together. And that makes a five week long course feel so short. And you don't need to worry about speaking Italian because the field trips are organized by professors and on-site coordinators. Nini here will help you with the essentials such as a SIM card. And if you travel by yourself, just be passionate, you know, as use gestures like Italian, oh, bellissimo. And I found that 
but very, very helpful. One last thing, uh, when traveling in Italy, travel light because that can make your trip much easier, especially Siena is on a hilltop city. I also packed a mosquito net because there were no window screens in most European buildings. So feel free to connect with me. I know this is short, but if you have any questions, you can reach me and I wish you good luck when applying for the summer abroad programs. And it will be a life-changing experience. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, we really appreciate your insight and on your experiences. Can't believe it was 2018. Joe was actually a work-study student for us as well a couple of years ago. We appreciate your time. It was great to see you again. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to ask Vincenzo Di Pietro to say a few words about his role in Siena. My name is Vincenzo Di Pietro. Everybody knows me as uh, Nini, you know, his nickname, which means baby, not anymore, unfortunately. I will be the on-site coordinator for the program. This will be my 18 years, so I became an adult with the, with this program. I will be there, you know, I will be living in your same residence. My role is, besides to have everything in the program uh, run smoothly, you know, I try to solve any bumps if there are with the field trips or, uh, uh, you know, with the classroom or anything uh, related to the academic program. I will be there also to help all of you, you know, if you have uh, any kind of issue, you know, we will be there 24-7, available for you. If you have any issues from the simple where I can buy an adapter or uh, if you have, a, I hope not, <laughs> medical issues, you know, we will be with you during all the, the path and uh, hopefully, you know, we don't have that issues. I will be like a, your older brother helping you, you know, that have experience there. I have been living in Siena in the past for 20 years. I lived uh, in Siena continuously. And then, uh, as I mentioned to you, after that, you know, I moved to the United States. I'm now from uh, in Atlanta, but uh, again, 18 years I have been uh, uh, back with the program uh, uh, in Siena with University of T program in Siena. I can consider it, even if I wasn't born there, I can consider Siena like my second or third house since my original house. You know where I was born near Bari in uh, in Italy, and then Atlanta and Siena. So everything that I can do it for the other uh, on-site assistant uh, will help you in all these things. Before to finish, if you have any question, I just want like I always like to mention uh, some uh, lines from uh, a movie that was in Italy. I mean, in an Italian movie that they said uh, when you leave a city, but in this case when you arrive in Italy, I can say that you, you will cry two times. One when you arrive because you know you say where. Well, where the hell I'm, uh, I'm in now, you know, because it will be a new experience for mo the most of you. And the second time that you will cry will be when you leave, because after, you know, five weeks, as everybody mentioned, you will uh, develop a lifelong friendship and experience. Uh, it will be really a great experience. And not because I want to promote the, the program, but it's true. I receive every year from students from 18 years ago that they say that has been the highlight of my life. And uh, they, a lot of them, they return just because they had uh, such a great experience. Experience. They just go as a tourist with the, the husband, uh, with the wives, uh, with the children, just because they, they have a great time. So, and that means that they, they really enjoy to stay there. Just to finish, as uh, Verdi, a famous uh, opera writer, said, you know, you can have the world if I can have Italy. So, and there is a reason about that. <laughs> so, you have to come to see that experience and why they said so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Nini. You could just stay for another 10 minutes. I think there's yeah, one yeah. question for you. I can't stress enough how important it is to to have a consistent or coordinator with us to coordinate this program. So thank you so much. I still don't know how you do it all. We're very fortunate to have you again this summer. Just a couple more very important details, how to apply. So I'm sure a lot of you have already created accounts or submitted applications. Applications are now open. The deadline to apply is March 1st at five o'clock PM. Participants are selected based on a set of criteria. It's not a first come first serve basis, just as long as you submit everything by March 1st at five, you're application will be assessed equally. We look at academic suitability. So we look at your transcript, your CGPA, as well as the specific courses that you do take. There's a free text area in our application. So you could explain if you don't have necessary prerequisites, what other experiences or what other courses that may help you with your application. We also take a look at a personal statement. We consider both about equally. This personal statement is a maximum of 500 words. There's no perfect statement, but we do give you some questions to help you uh, create this statement. Basically, we would just want to know why you're interested in this program, why you're interested in taking this course, and how it's going to contribute to your academic plans and aspirations. The last step is to uh, pay a $200 application fee. This is refunded if you're not selected for the course that you did apply for. There's 
a separate application and fee for each summer abroad program. So if you're interested in Italy and you also want to apply for Central Europe, you can do so. They're just two separate application fees and applications. And if you're registered with accessibility services, this is indicated in our application, you must provide a letter from your accessibility services advisor. And there's more directions on our application if that applies to you. So this is what our application looks like for Italy. Basically, you have up to two choices. You have a first choice course if you want to have a second choice course to be considered for. It's not mandatory, but you do have that option too. You pay the $200 application fee and you press submit. Make sure you press submit. Your application is already changes status from incomplete to pending. And then you wait for us and we will give you a notification. So speaking on which, one more slide of really important information. We will be making admission decisions a bit later this year. It will be in late March to early April. There are a couple of really important notes to consider. Admissions for on-site summer abroad programs are conditional upon the government of Canada allowing travel outside of Canada. So currently, there is still suspension of non-essential travel for international travel for U of T. So if you look at the Global Fierce Canada website, you can still see that there is a restriction in place as we speak. We are very, very optimistic and hopeful that this advisory is going to be lifted by the end of March. And if so, we are going to go on with our plan, offer the programs that we did present to you today. However, just know presently, we are still restricted and the university is restricted any non-essential travel abroad. Now, if the travel restrictions are not lifted by late March, something does, as we know, the last two years, unexpected things could happen. On-site programs will and courses will pivot to virtual programs. And, and the virtual programs will be similar to what we offered last year. We still have the opportunity to do the course. It will just be offered virtually. And you will be asked at that point if you would like to do the virtual course or not. If you are set to go to Italy, would like to complete the virtual course, and you decide that you do not like to proceed with taking the course virtually, we will refund your application fee at that point in time. So this is our backup. We want to make sure that there is course continuity and we still can offer the course to students if we are still restricted in traveling end of March. So fingers crossed in the next couple of weeks, things will be updated. We're going to be sending notifications as well as some updates to all students who've applied for our courses. So again, if for any reason that the restrictions are still there by the end of March, uh, we're going to pivot to virtual and you will have a choice to decide whether or not you want to complete the virtual course or not. If not, we will refund the application fee um, at that time. Moving on, the costs for Italy, and this is just for on-site courses. This is all on the website. You have the application fee, the course fee. Uh, this is a U of T course, so you have to pay incidental fees as well. Depending on which course that you're admitted to, there's different total costs for field trip fees. Take a look at our website and review the different costs, and you'll get to know specifically through the course outlines as well as this, the descriptions, the cities, and the places that you do go to. Accommodations are $750, and this is based on double room accommodation. Airfare at the time of December 2021, from here, round trip from here to Rome was $982. So that's what we have for you to budget. However, this, of course, can change depending on when you buy your tickets. Uh, meals, as I mentioned, there's no meal plan, so you have to budget for that. So depending on which course that you are admitted to, the approximately total program cost for domestic students is $7,500. $56 to $8,326. And for international students, it's $8,711 to $9,481. Again, more information is on our website. If you have any questions in regards to this, this is just a budget. Please email us and we're more than happy to walk you through these line items. So in terms of financial assistance, if you're eligible for OSAP, you could apply for an extension since this is a summer course. Please note that OSAP funds are not released close to the start of the program and you cannot defer your fees. So just keep that in mind. And we are offering up to 15 awards at $3,000 each for the Italy program. This is a very special year for us. In order to apply for a bursary or an award that is administered through our office, it's already
already embedded in the program application. So if you're eligible to apply for an award, just follow the steps and make sure that you submit your application by March 1st. We look at financial need and academic merit, and you must have 4.0 U of T credits by last December with a minimum of 2.25. You must be Canadian citizen or permanent resident. And unfortunately, international students are not eligible. Some are brought awards for the Italy program, as I mentioned, we've earmarked 15 awards for this program. But please note that this will not cover the full cost of the program. So you must look at others' resources, talk with your registrar to see what other sources, awards, bursaries that may be available to you if you're admitted to this program. So again, check with your registrar's office, faculty, departments, and colleges for possible awards and bursaries. Let's just assume everything is a go. Then after notification, you have one week to confirm your participation. And by doing so, you have to pay a $1,000 deposit. So that's basically you just telling us that you're in, we, you want us to reserve a spot, that would be the next step. If you decline an offer, you will not get the application fee back. And remaining fees are due roughly four weeks after the deposit is due. So that exact date will be published in the next few weeks. And one last slide in regards to visas and, and insurance. As I did mention, this is a very different year at different times. You want to first think about your visas. You, you are responsible for arranging your own visa. If necessary, our office will provide supporting documents, such as an admission letter if needed. For Italy, Canadian citizens require a passport valid for six months beyond return date. International students must check with an embassy or consulate for requirements of getting a Schengen visa. Summer abroad provides supporting document, as I mentioned. If possible, apply in Toronto or in Canada. So our office, you know, we're nearby to help you in terms of supporting you with your application. You want to review the terms and conditions of travel, health, and flight insurance. And we cannot stress this enough in terms of COVID co coverage, cancellation insurance. So please read the fine print and make sure you know what you're covered for. We're going to send more information to students in terms of checklists of what to look for when you're purchasing insurance. But to this is very important and we want to make sure that you have this top of mind. Thank you so much for sticking around. If you want more information, there's our website. You can set up a virtual appointment with a summer abroad advisor and here are other ways for you to connect with us. I'm going to take a look and to see if there's any more questions. How short is the walk from the residence to the classroom? Depends from, uh, of course, from which residence are you accommodated. Usually the, the walk can be between 15 and 20 minutes. How competitive it is to get into the Italian courses. I would say that it's very competitive to apply for Italian courses. There's a wide range of students who take this course as well. So we'd be looking at your personal statement as well as your courses. Um, but I wouldn't say it's highly competitive to get in. Um, each year is different. But Professor Letary, can you just mention in the past the type of um, classes that you have taught? It is uh, uh, quite competitive. However, uh, we've always managed uh, to accommodate uh, all good students, right? It is competitive, but uh, it is also true that uh, we do our best to accommodate everyone. Um, if we arrive in Siena a week early due to flight costs, will we be able to stay in residence early? Well, depends how early you you arrive in Siena, because if you arrive the day the day before, we can try to arrange that. You know, if you instead you arrive three, four days, we cannot ensure because we, remember, we are going to stay in the student residence. So there are other students eventually in the in the residence and you know there is a kind of uh, change <laughs> change of the the people the students so if they left earlier of course you know we can try check university if it is possible generically speaking you know if it's very few probably yes otherwise you have to find a bnb or uh, some cheap hotel where you can stay one or two days if you arrive earlier i want to thank everybody for your participation um all the professors um nini uh, Joe, thank you so much for attending. Uh, Anastasia, Lorraine, and Wendy for your help of answering all these questions. I really, it takes it takes a team. And I have to say that, you know, it, it's it's such a privilege and pre pleasure to uh, work with all of you. So thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see you in Italy in summer. And again, please contact our office at any time, especially in the next couple of weeks, if you have any questions. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Mm -hmm.